Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending our uh, third session out of a three-part series on uh, different employment issues that you might be facing. The first two were over hiring and firing, and then the third one we decided to do uh, was a piece on social media. Uh, everybody's talking about it. I'm sure you've read plenty about it, heard about it in the media, um, and it's one of those areas of the law that lawyers love because it's really fertile ground for all sorts of stupid behavior. Um, and so what I want to do is spend the next half an hour talking you through some of those issues. Um, I want to remind everyone that if you'd like to submit questions, I can actually see them on my screen here and I'd be happy to, to read them out loud and then answer them as best I can. Uh, certainly if you have questions you'd like to ask offline, uh, we can make that happen as well. Um, but let's see what we can uh, make sense of out of this whole really growing and rapidly changing area of the law. You know, social media is one of those things, uh, it's just like any other technological innovation. It can be a great thing and it can be a huge burden. It's opened up all sorts of business opportunities, I'm sure, for your own businesses, but it's also opened a Pandora's box of all kinds of idiotic behavior. It's just a whole other place for people to get online and, and do things that they used to do in private, and now they do it in public ways, and it turns into something that goes viral. Uh, we're going to talk about how you can try to control some of that, and again, some of the, the, the positive uses of social media and, and some of the dark sides of it. So let's first talk about social networking and employer monitoring. Um, I want to show you some statistics to start out here. Um, I don't know if in your businesses you uh, use social networking sites as a recruiting or a, a hiring tool, uh, but I'll give you some idea of what folks are doing out there. Um, as you can see, hopefully on your screen, um, you know, close to half of employers that are reporting um, are using social networking sites to screen candidates. Um, I personally do it in my business, for example. I think it's a useful tool. It's a place where you can sort of see what the candidate looks like when they have their hair down. Um, it's not an interview set situation, so they're not necessarily on their best behavior. You get a sense for what they might be like outside of work. Now, there are downsides to that, and I'll show those to you in a minute. Um, and as you can see, fully, uh, you know, 20% uh, almost of employers find information on social networking sites that make, it, make a difference when deciding to hire somebody. And I can tell you again from my own personal experience, I have found that kind of content and uh, used it to make decisions on hiring, both to hire and also to pass on people. Um, just more statistics on what employers are doing, and I'll be curious to know what you all are doing. Um, fully two-thirds of employers are now monitoring internet connections. Uh, again, my place of employment, we do it. Um, most places do. They at least have firewalls in place to make sure they understand what type of sites people are using. Um, you know, only 12%, but I think you're going to see this number rise. Uh, they will monitor the blogosphere, which is a whole brand new term uh, that uh, describes what's going on out there and people that are writing things about your company. You know, 10% are monitoring social media sites and almost a half are now monitoring email. Um, there are so many different places. Now look at all those different places where your name can be out there, either in a very positive way or in a very negative way. And what can you do to control it? Now, uh, again, the idea of screening people and, and monitoring this information. Is it legal? Is it advisable? And I guess those are two different questions. Uh, to go onto the internet and look for this information. Well, let's start with a basic proposition. The idea is that if I put my personal information out there on Facebook or LinkedIn or MySpace, that's probably a dated one at this point, but I know that there are other new sites out there, Instagram, um, I have weakened my own expectation of privacy. Um, and that's the way that the courts look at this. And so, for example, we have this case that came out in 2007, and this is really where the case law is going. Most courts are now saying, and most of the courts around our neck of the woods are saying that, yes, employers may lawfully search and Google uh, in, for information about applicants. And the reason being is it's quite simple. You put this information out there into a at least semi-public uh, forum, 
And there's no reason why an employer can't look at that information and draw some conclusions about that person based upon it. It's not that different than being out public and, and uh, being at the, the water cooler, for example. If you're saying something there and it's within earshot of other folks and I hear it, I can use it. It's the same thing with Google and, and all of the different websites that we talked about. So now one thing I will tell you, you have to be careful with. I've had employers in the past that have used sort of uh, underhanded means, let's say, to try to mine information off of Facebook. And so they'll try to friend somebody under false pretenses and, and, uh, and get into their information that way. Courts are much less likely to protect you if you do something like that. If you use a ruse, let's say, um, to try to, to mine information off of Facebook, uh, a court is much more likely to say that that person had a reasonable expectation of privacy because they wouldn't have turned this information over necessarily if they really knew who that person was that was looking for the information. Um, now, on the other hand, like I say, if there's stuff that's on their wall and it's a public wall and you can access it, you can use it. So that's the legal side of it. Let's talk about the, oh, I'm not moving forward here. There we go. Um, and here's the, the advisability of it. Think about this. What if a candidate that you're looking at did things like this? Posted inappropriate photos, drinking drug use uh, on their website. Is that somebody you want to hire? Maybe, maybe not. That's at least close to the line. Bad mouth his previous employer, co-workers, clients, customers. All right, now I'm starting to think that this is, might be somebody that I don't want to work with, even if they had a legitimate reason to bad mouth their employer and their co-workers and their clients. I'm not so sure I'd want to bring that person on board. That sounds like a risk. Uh, made discriminatory comments. Okay, now we're going way over the line into somebody I probably don't want. Lied about their qualifications. You'd be surprised how many times you can find that information uh, if you go out and mine the social media that's out there. Um, you may find out, for example, that a candidate that you're looking at claims that he's currently working at X, Y, and Z Corp. And you find out if you look on their social, social media sites that they haven't worked in six months and that they've been backpacking uh, around the country. Um, now you know that they've probably lied or at least stretched their qualifications. Uh, this is another important one. Sometimes you'll find people that are really stupid, frankly, about uh, managing confidential information about their employers and their customers and, and vendors and so on. Um, this is all information that I think is relevant. And here's a, a fun example of that. Um, real life example, uh, somebody who just got a job at Cisco and you think that's a fantastic place to work, right? And this guy writes on his social media page, just Cisco just offered me a job. Now I have to weigh the utility of a fatty paycheck against the daily commute to San Jose and hating the work. Well, Cisco obviously understands this stuff, and this is what somebody wrote back. Uh, who's the hiring manager? I'm sure they would love to know that you'll hate the work. We here at Cisco are versed in the web. Uh, not exactly the guy that you're looking for to hire, and shockingly, this person was let go. So again, you can really, it's a little bit like email and text messaging. You know this, that this is where people really show what their true stripes are like. Um, employers are getting smarter about using that information. Um, there are good reasons for you to do that. There are some downsides, and let's talk about those. The flip side of the coin is this, and for those of you that remember our first session or that participated in our first session, we talked about this, um, the idea of interviewing and what are the basic rules around interviewing. This is a basic premise that you always have to remember when you're interviewing or, or just picking anybody to, to work for you. All of your candidates have to be uh, picked based on their qualifications and likelihood of success, uh, not with regard to any protected characteristic. What are those protected characteristics? Remember them. Race, gender, age, uh, disability or medical condition, veteran status. Um, gender identity is another new one. Um, so all of those things that you know of that are protected under the law, if you start mining information off of Google that might reveal some of those qualifications, some of those characteristics of that person, 
you might be uh, accused of making a decision based not on likelihood of success, but based on the fact that you looked at my Facebook page and saw that I'm a cancer survivor. And uh, you know that I run in, in the Susan G. Komen race every year, and so therefore, this must be the reason why I didn't get my job. And you can see how that could play itself out. I go through an interview process. I think I had a great interview. Knocked it out of the ballpark. Everybody that met me loved me. I find out later that you didn't hire me. Uh, I find out through the grapevine that you were looking at my Facebook page and so on. I remember that I've got on my Facebook page information about the last time that I had chemo treatment. And all of a sudden I start thinking, you know what? Maybe it had a little bit more to do with that. In fact, you didn't want me on your health care plan because I was going to be a real burden on you. So that's the care, that's the, a critical factor that you need to look at. And again, remember, the things that you're looking at are ability to do the job, interest in doing the job, things to avoid. Remember these. Again, if you sat through our first session, you know these. I'm not supposed to ask questions about when and where you were born, your union activities. Um, you know, we don't do photographs as part of an interview process because that tends to reveal uh, uh, protected information about people, past or current medical conditions, native language, past litigation experience. Um, we don't ask those in interviews, and yet sometimes if we look for this information on Google, we may stumble across this type of info. So how do you sort of insulate yourself from being accused of wrongfully using information off of it? I'll tell you how we do it where I work. We have one person who is dedicated towards uh, to uh, screening this information. So if we have a candidate for a management position, let's say, um, I will have one person in my HR group who will take a look on all of the, again, the usual suspects, the Facebooks, the LinkedIn's, the other places where you can Google information about people. And that person will then report back to me in written format anything that they find that might be useful to me in making a determination about their ability to do, to do the job, their interest in doing the job, likelihood of success, did they lie somewhere, for example, on their application, and so on. And that way, I'm, I'm the decision maker. I'm the one that makes the hire. And if, if that person in my HR group happens to stumble across the Susan G. Komen run and things of that nature, she's not going to report that to me, all right? There's a level of, there's a firewall there. It's not a perfect firewall, but it's a pretty good firewall. And what it allows then is for that information to be filtered to me in a way that is legal and legitimate. I only get the information that I really need to know from her. I get it in written format so that I know there's a nice clear record of what it was that she reported to me and what I used as part of my decision-making process. So that's an important thing, a small step that you can take. I don't know how big any of your offices are. Um, you know, you don't need to have a huge organization to make this work. It really just needs a, a, a group of two to do this. You have one person that looks at the information and reports back only that stuff that might be relevant to the job and likelihood of job success. Um, and that person does not report to the decision maker anything about, again, race, gender, disability, veteran status, things of that nature. You don't want or need that information to make a higher decision. So that's one way you can use social media in a positive way and, again, learn something about somebody. Because, look, we all know when you go through a higher process, it's expensive, it's time-consuming. And if you make the wrong choice, um, you just set yourself back another six months because Ultimately, that person might fail, and then you've got to go through it and do it all over again. And uh, anybody who's done that uh, for any period of time knows what an incredible, incredible burden that can be on the, on the business. Um, not only can candidates stick their, mouth, their foot in their mouth, uh, you can do it too. Uh, and I've seen this in plenty of lawsuits. I've seen admissions that are made on different Facebook pages and so on that happen to support a co-worker's litigation. And so, you know, you go into a deposition, you sit down, and you start talking about why this person failed and all the reasons why they didn't do their job right. And the lawyer on the other side slides a copy of, of your Facebook page where you said, boy, I think he really got shafted when he got terminated. 
um, this is not a place to write that stuff down, all right? Um, regardless of how you might feel, and this is a good lesson, uh, frankly, for your employees also, um, this is not a place to, to uh, Facebook and other places on the Internet are not places to lodge those types of opinions. When you do that, all you're doing is creating admissions that, that can help somebody. And I will tell you, I've litigated these cases for years and years. Um, one of my favorite places to search for information to help my side of the case was on the Internet. Um, anytime I would sit down and, and get ready to take the deposition of a witness, I will Google their information and I will look for anything out there where they might have talked about this piece of litigation or this fact pattern um, in any way that, that might be useful to me. Admissions to support third-party claims. You don't want to be on the Internet in any place talking about how a, a customer or a vendor, um, you know, we screwed up with that person, all right? Now, should you have those conversations internally? Absolutely, because you want to fix the problems you have with customers and vendors and suppliers and folks like that. But to put anything out there in a public or semi-public forum where you are out there talking about how those folks got screwed, believe me, their lawyers are going to be doing the same thing that I've been doing, and they will find that and they will use that against you. And whatever words you chose, I can assure you, they will be twisted against you. This is what lawyers do. We do this for a living. We, we turn people's words into things they never meant them to be. Um, so if you have to have conversations about customer problems and vendor problems and supplier problems, uh, do that offline, please. Obviously, you can create your own problems in, in the form of bad public relations. Um, there are a million examples of these. I can throw out a couple names. Donald Sterling, um, you know, you think of anybody who has done anything in a, in a public or even a, what he perceived to be a private area, um, things go viral very quickly. You can all think of examples of situations where somebody went on a rant um, about an employee, a customer, uh, a, a co-worker, um, and left it in a place that can then be put on YouTube, and then it goes viral. And you've probably looked at one of those in the last week. They, they happen all the time. And here's the biggest issue I have, though, with the use of social media. You need to understand what the National Labor Relations Board is talking about here. Um, the National Labor Relations Board, and this is the, the group, this is a federal agency that deals with unions, but not just unions. And if you have a non-unionized workforce, don't think that this law doesn't apply to you because it does. Um, and one of the main things that the Na National Labor Relations Act does is it protects what the law calls concerted activities. What is, does that mean? It basically means two or more employees that are getting together in a concerted way. They're, they're, I don't want to say conspiring, that's not the right word, but they're talking together about workplace conditions. They're not happy about their pay. They're not happy about their boss. They're not happy about their benefit structure or the hours that they work. When two employees or more are having discussions like that, it's a protected conversation, um, and they're doing it for their mutual aid and protection. That's the way that the law looks at it. And so if they're having that conversation in a private office, it's protected. If they're having that conversation by the water cooler or by the coffee pot, it's protected. And here's the big change. In the last couple of years, the LRB has taken the position that if they have that conversation in a public forum, on Facebook and, and MySpace and Instagram and other places like that, it is also protected. And that's the one that surprised a lot of employers, and I want to make sure that everybody's aware of that. Um, and again, it, this applies in union and non-union contexts. Don't think that it doesn't apply to you. Um, here's the case that really kicked the whole thing off. I'll, I'll describe it to you briefly. This was a company that was an EMT response uh, uh, company out in Connecticut. And we had a woman named Dawn Marie who was an EMT. And she posted uh, a series of negative comments about her supervisor on her private Facebook page. Uh, it was private, but of course people talked about it and it worked its way back into the workplace and she got herself fired. Let me show you what she was talking about. Um, this is what she was talking about with a friend of hers. Looks like I'm getting some time off. I uh, love how the company allows a 17 to be a supervisor. A 17 was their code for a psychiatric patient. So 
calling her supervisor crazy, I guess. Um, person writes back, what happened? Uh, what now? And she writes back, Frank is being a blank. Um, uh, commenter writes back, I'm so glad I left her. So she, this one doesn't even work there. The person that she's talking to is not a coworker, but a former coworker. Uh, oh, he's back, huh? Yep, and, and yep. you can see some text issues here, but he's a, a scumbag as usual. Oh, I'm sorry, hon, chin up. Uh, she ends up getting fired over this. Why? Because she called her uh, supervisor a psycho, a psycho, a scumbag, and a D. Um, gets fired for that, and NLRB turns around and says, no, nope, you can't do that. That's a protected conversation that she was having. Was it a little tawdry? Was it a little disparaging? Yes. Um, but it's a conversation that she is allowed to have. She could have that conversation again in her office, by the coffee pot, and amazingly, uh, on Facebook as well. And the knee-jerk reaction as an employer, you look at that and you say, how can I not fire that person? How is it that I'm not allowed to do that? My only advice to you here is tread lightly because this is the type of comment and the type of discussion that the NLRB is looking at and saying, you know what, we want people to be free to have this type of discussion even if it's on Facebook and even if some of the language is, is, is a little rough. Uh, a couple of other cases to give you. Um, and again, this is all coming down to context. You've got five employees that are fired for posting Facebook comments criticizing their employer's staffing and workload levels. You can see this now, hopefully the trend that we're showing here is, if it's something about the workplace and it's two or more employees getting together to complain about the workplace, that conversation is probably going to be protected and you need to look real closely before you decide to discipline. Um, I'll throw a couple of other layers on. What if they were talking about something and revealed sensitive customer information, sensitive patient information? Um, financial information. Okay, now you're starting to work into areas where the NLRB might allow you to make some, some decisions because that goes over the line of, I think, protected concerted activity. Uh, this was another fun one. This was out in Arizona. TV reporter tweets out at night, what? No overnight homicide? WTF, uh, you're slacking Tucson. She gets fired for writing that on her tweet, on her Twitter page. Um, she sues. NLRB says, eh, I don't think that's protected because what are you talking about? You're not talking about workplace issues here. You're just slamming uh, the city of Tucson. And your employer has a legitimate interest in not having you out there in a very public way uh, representing their you know, uh, TV station because you know what? It's going to turn off viewers. So it all comes down to context. What is it that that person is talking about? Are they talking about workplace issues? Is it tied in any way to their job performance? Or are they ranting and raving about uh, you know, any other uh, number of issues that you can think of? Is it discriminatory? Are they using the N-word or the C-word or some other horrible thing? You're going to find a lot less legal pr uh, protection in situations like that. All right, um, But if they are doing anything that can be considered to be two or more co-workers huddling together for their quote-unquote protection, there's going to be a higher level of expectation of, of um, you know, legal protection for that person. Another key thing, just like any of your other workplace policies, you've got to be consistent. All right? So if you're going to decide to take an action against somebody for writing something negative about you or something racist or politically inappropriate um, on, on their Facebook page, You've got to be consistent with the next guy who does something similar to that. If you're not, you're just inviting yourself um, into a lawsuit. Um, and again, you've got to avoid those fine uh, distinctions. Um, for example, I see a lot of employers that will allow some sort of negative chatter out there, but as soon as it starts to take on any flavor of union organizing, I'm going to fire them for that. The NLRB will sniff that right out and, and come to a conclusion that you're not being content neutral. Um, you're making a decision that's based on an illegal consideration, which is an employee's right to decide to unionize or not unionize. All right. 
last few minutes I wanted to spend with uh, more fun with uh, social media just to give you an idea of the stupid things that people do and the things that you can do as an employer to deal with them. Um, this was a fun one that happened a few years ago back in 2010. You may remember this was about the time that LeBron James uh, was getting ready to take his talents down to uh, South Beach and we had a campaign in the city of Cleveland, you may remember it was Beards for Braun. Uh, men were supposed to grow beards out, apparently because this would somehow persuade LeBron James to stay in Cleveland, obviously it didn't work. Um, a young lady in town who happened to be a lawyer at a very prominent firm here in Cleveland decided to take up her own campaign, Bushes for Braun. Um, different type of hair that we're talking about here on a different part of the female's anatomy. I'll leave it at that. Um, she decided to take this thing viral and so she created her Bushes for Braun campaign. Um, even uh, decided to get her picture taken with Snoop Dogg. Um, and I will tell you, if you Googled this woman's name, if you were looking for her and, and looking for her assistance, perhaps on a legal matter, the first thing that came up on your Google search was Bushes for Braun. Not her link to her job at her law firm, but Bushes for Braun. Well, guess what? She lost her job. This was not protected concerted activity. This was just dumb behavior that happened to really affect her uh, ability to do her job effectively because this is the type of thing that will uh, call into question somebody's you know, fitness, I guess, for the job is the way that some people might look at it. And you look at it and you say, this is her off-duty work time. This, she's not working. She can do whatever she wants to do on her own time. And that is all very true. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you're going to do something in your off time that affects your ability to, uh, to perform your job well while you're at work, employers have a right to deal with that. If I'm a neo-Nazi and I hide that well while I'm at work, but I go home at night and I put the white sheet on and I post something on, on uh, Facebook just like this, will that follow me back to work? I'll bet you it will. I don't think people uh, will separate out those two and come to any conclusion that I'm any different between the two. Uh, another quick Facebook offense. This was a good one uh, for employers. Intermittent FMLA for chronic back pain. Guy takes the day off because he's having crippling pain. That's what he says in his voicemail message to his supervisor. And yet we have Facebook photos that are showing him later in the day at the local Oktoberfest, big beer stein in hand and having a good time. Employer decides to fire him and the judge upholds that and says, yes, I think that's fair. The employer had an honest belief that he was engaged in some shenanigans here. And as you might imagine, what the employee tried to do here is get his doctor to write a note saying, listen, the back pain was crippling. It wasn't crippling enough that he couldn't go to the Oktoberfest. Um, and so that was okay. And so I'm not sure why you're firing this guy. And the judge had enough, had, would have none of it. The judge uh, made a decision, and I think it's a very honest and fair decision to say, look, the employer can look at this. He can hear the message and hear this horrible pain in this man's voice. And then two, three hours later, he's walking around with a beer stein at Oktoberfest. I don't care what the, what the, the doctor is writing about this. This looks like this is, is uh, uh, no good. And so FMLA fraud can be a terminable offense. So if you hear about it, and the way that this always happens is people chatter about it in the workplace, go look for it, go find it, and see if it doesn't match up with what the empl employee has been telling you. All right. One more I will leave you with. Uh, this was astonishing to me. Around the world in 72 hours, Kelly Blazik, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this one, um, described herself as the mother of the Cleveland Job Bank. Um, and the Cleveland Job Bank, for those of you that don't know, is a place to go. And um, it, it's a great recruitment tool, particularly for people in sales and marketing. Um, and um, it's it, it, it really has been quite a success in, in large part due to Kelly Blazik, to be honest. Um, received an email from a recent college grad, this is Kelly receiving it, wanting to connect with her on LinkedIn. Um, Kelly is not too happy about that, sends a really nasty message back. Apparently you've heard that I produced a job bank and decided it would be stunningly helpful for your career prospects if I shared my 960 plus LinkedIn connections with you, a total stranger who has nothing to offer me. 
Uh, oh, can't see that one. Uh, I love the sense of entitlement in your generation, and I therefore enjoy denying your request. You're welcome for your humility lesson for the year. Not exactly nice, and I'm guessing Kelly was having a bad day when she wrote this. Um, now, if she had said this to this person, bad enough. When you write it on LinkedIn, guess what happens? And I think uh, many of you on this call probably know what happens. The woman who was the target of all of this decided to take it onto Facebook, and it went viral. Um, and here are some of the things that people started writing back about Kelly Blazik. It only takes a few shares. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> um, all it takes is one person to send it out. Uh, bet the, uh, her precious contacts will drop her like a bad habit. That is true, by the way. Trust me, people. Uh, I'm not even sure what that little hashtag means, but Kelly Blazik does not represent our profession. So everybody starts piling on to Kelly Blazik. Um, don't think this can't happen to you. If you have a bad day and you are irritated with a customer, a coworker, uh, an employee, a vendor, and you lash out at that person in email or even on a voicemail, again, think of Donald Sterling. Um, people record stuff. People will take that stuff and they will make it go uh, viral, um, especially if you use colorful, interesting, stupid language. It's going to find itself out there and it's almost impossible to stop. Uh, and again, in Kelly's case, within 72 hours, uh, it was headline news in Cleveland. It was actually on the top half of the fold of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. It made it onto CNN, all the way to the BBC. Um, out of Cleveland, Ohio, this little tiny story mushroomed into this huge uh, uh, mess. That's what social media can do. So if you have to have those kinds of conversations with coworkers, with employees, with customers, do it in a way that does not lend itself to going viral. All right? Think before you act. This is something we talked about with the disciplinary and the termination um, seminar we did three weeks ago. Uh, it's particularly true in this day and age. Um, it's much, much harder now, I hate to say it, but to have a bad day. Uh, if you have a bad day and you do it, it's much more likely to be recorded. And if it is ever recorded, either by voice or uh, by video or by Facebook or email, it's very likely that somebody can take that and move it along and send it along. And it's very hard to stop once you get to that point. And in fact, last thing I'll tell you, somebody even made a Krabby Blazik uh, par uh, parody on Twitter for her. Um, it's amazing how much time people have to do things like this to each other. But this is the way that this is the world that we live in now. And she had to turn in her com Communicator of the Year award. So adding rubbing salt in her wounds, I guess. That's all I have for you on this one. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, I don't see any. So we will log off at this point, but I want to remind you um, that if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask offline without the group on, feel free to do so. Uh, I will uh, make contact with you and, and be happy to answer any questions if you have an ongoing issue with social media, if you have social media policy issues, if you want to write one for your handbook, I can help you with that as well. Um, so again, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope this was useful and hopefully somewhat entertaining. Social media usually is. And I'll turn it over to Bridget at this point. Okay, thank you very much for joining us for the BBB Flash webinar.